Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, New International Version. Hello, welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm Victoria Kay. We're glad that you were able to join us for another episode of Anchored by Truth. Today, we are nearing the conclusion of our series on the Ten Commandments, because today we are going to discuss the Tenth Commandment. We heard the Tenth Commandment in our opening scripture. This is a particularly important commandment, and as we will see, it was placed as number ten for a reason. To help us with understanding the critical role the Tenth Commandment plays, we have R.D. Fierro in the studio. R.D. is an author and the founder of Crystal Sea Books. R.D., before we actually get into our discussion of the command against coveting anything that belongs to our neighbor, are there any big ideas that concern all of the commandments that we should review? Well, before we get into that, I would also like to welcome everyone today to this episode of Anchored by Truth. As you mentioned, we're getting close to the end of this series on the Ten Commandments, but we think it's been a really important series. I think it's been a good series because I think we've introduced some ideas in our series that perhaps people don't think about too often when it comes to the Ten Commandments. So often we hear the Ten Commandments, we hear the label the Ten Commandments, and we just sort of think, okay, those are ten things that I'm supposed to do, and I'm probably not doing, but those are ten things that I'm supposed to do. But we don't think of the Ten Commandments and the place that they occupy in redemptive history. We don't think about the place that they occupy in the unfolding plan of redemption that God has been carrying on ever since the fall. And that's one of the things that we really wanted to point out in this series of the Ten Commandments is that the Ten Commandments are not just an isolated group of instructions that God decided to give to the Hebrews when they were leaving Egypt or just insert into the Bible so that we'd all have another set of restrictions on us. God gave the commandments to the Hebrew people because he wanted them to start their new life as a nation in the promised land on a positive note, on a note that would allow him to continue to be able to bless the nation as it went forward. So in terms of the big ideas that we've been covering in this series, certainly that's one of the big ideas is that the Ten Commandments were a critical, a very important part of the overall unfolding plan of redemption. And I don't want to spend too much time on a review of the things that we've gone over. Anyone who would like to hear any of our previous episodes, they can always find them on our website, crystalseabooks.com. That's C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-S-E-A-B-O-O-K-S dot com. But let me now mention two big ideas that we have been mentioning throughout this series. One big idea is that the Ten Commandments were given to us for our benefit. Sure, the commandments come from God, but God does not get anything out of the commandments. We get something out of the commandments when we obey them. Now, the commandments are sometimes divided into two groups that are often referred to as tables, the first table and the second table. The first table of the commandments is often considered to consist of the first four commandments And that so-called first table helps us to have a better relationship with God. And the second table consists of the last six commandments. And when we obey them, it helps people have a better relationship with other people. Right. God gave us the Ten Commandments to help us have better lives. And not to have just a better life on this world, but to have a better life as we move on into eternity, which we're all going to do. So that's one big idea that we need to keep in mind. And another big idea that we need to keep in mind to note is that the common thread that runs through all the commandments 
is that all of the commandments are concerned with dignity, especially the dignity of God. The first three commandments are all about the dignity of God's nature. There is only one God who is infinitely holy, powerful, and present. Therefore, we must not worship any other gods or demean God by creating false images of Him or misusing His holy name. And the fourth and the fifth commandments are concerned with the dignity of God's creation. The fourth commandment to honor the Sabbath concerns the period of God's creative activity. And the fifth commandment to honor our fathers and mothers concerns the product of God's creative activity, because man was the only creature created in God's image. Yes, and the sixth through tenth commandments are also concerned with dignity. The sixth commandment is concerned with the dignity of human life. The seventh, the dignity of marriage. The eighth, the dignity of work. Now, the eighth commandment, just in case people are wondering, says, do not steal. And that's concerned with the dignity of work because it is through our labor that we produce the goods and services that we need to sustain our lives. So if someone steals any of those goods or services, regardless of the amount or value, the thief has exhibited a blatant disregard for the labor and work of another person. And then we saw in our last episode of Anchored by Truth that the ninth commandment, which is the prohibition against lying, is concerned with the dignity of words and the dignity of truth. You know, words are so important to God that God used them when he created the heavenly bodies, the land and the sea, and living creatures. And of course, truth is so important to God, to Jesus, that Jesus personally identified himself as the truth. And we hear that in every episode of Anchored by Truth in our opening, where we use the quote where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In our culture, we almost take it for granted that every person tells lies at some point. Lying is so pervasive, we start seeing lying or one of its many forms, political spin, misleading advertisement, misstatements on tax forms, etc., as being no big deal. But lying in any form is a big deal to God. So it should be a big deal to us. Exactly. So, we see that the first nine commandments are all concerned with dignity. And to complete this thread, as odd as it may sound, the tenth commandment is concerned with the dignity of desire. The dignity of desire. You mentioned that last time. And as we said, that's a phrase you probably don't hear every day. So, let's get into that. What is the dignity of desire? The dignity of desire is a way of saying that God built human beings with a desire for Him. This built-in desire for God has been recognized by many of the greatest Christian thinkers. For instance, the French mathematician Blaise Pascal wrote Pensee, which was a defense of the Christian religion. The word Pensee means a thought or a reflection. In the book, Pascal said, quote, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself, unquote. Pascal recognized that when God made man in his own image, God ensured that his image bearer would always be drawn to the source of that image, which is God himself. The image bearer would have a desire to know the source of the image and to be known by the source. That desire, the built-in desire for God, like all other desires, was corrupted by the fall. And as a consequence, man's fallen desires began to wander to desiring lesser things. So much so that we almost think of desire today as being a bad thing. But it didn't start out that way, and it shouldn't be that way. Too often, we equate the words desire with lust. And as a general rule, lust is sinful. So we think we are to avoid it. And, of course, we should avoid sinful lusts. But desire need not be sinful. The Bible commands us to desire good things. 
For instance, in the opening lines of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray for, quote, God's kingdom to come and God's will be done. If we want God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done, then obviously we are to desire those things. We are to desire to live holy lives, to have faith, and to please God. We are to desire to spend an eternity with God in heaven. Desire is a basic attribute of being human, and there is nothing wrong with desire. There is a lot wrong with allowing our desire to be transformed into sinful lusts. The Tenth Commandment, not to covet anything of our neighbors, helps us see where and how to draw the line. The Tenth Commandment is concerned with preserving the dignity of desire. You know, one way to think about the Tenth Commandment is to recognize that there is nothing wrong with covetousness itself, but there is a lot wrong with coveting the wrong things. I think it might be fair to say that the gist of the Tenth Commandment is that we should never covet lesser things, things other than God himself or those things that God has commended to our use and for our good. I see where you're going with saying that we should not covet lesser things. God built us to covet a strong, close relationship with Him. The moment we turn our attention away from God, we are automatically turning our attention to lesser things. There is nothing higher and greater than God. There can be nothing higher and greater than God. God is perfectly pure, holy, just, and beautiful. So as long as we keep our desires focused on God and His will, we will be protected from coveting lesser things. This does not mean that we cannot or will not possess lesser things, the things we need from this creation necessary for life and existence. But we must keep our priorities straight. Jesus told us this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 31 through 33, when he said, quote, Don't worry about these things, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need, unquote. And that's from the New Living Translation. Exactly. We need to be careful when we think about the Tenth Commandment, because sometimes we think it says don't covet. But that's not what it says at all. The Tenth Commandment tells us not to covet anything that belongs to our neighbor, their house, their spouse, their animals, or any of their property. Now, one basic reason for this is that to covet anything that belongs to our neighbor exhibits dissatisfaction with God's provision for us. Coveting things of our neighbor, it's a form of ingratitude. It's a way of saying that God has been good to our neighbor, but not good to us. When we covet things that belong to our neighbor, it's a refusal to acknowledge that God has been good to us. So, coveting what belongs to our neighbor actually expresses displeasure for what God has provided for us. In a way, we think that covetousness for something that belongs to someone else shouldn't be that serious. Covetousness is, after all, mental or psychological. It's not like stealing or lying where we have actually taken an action that injures another person. Coveting is internal, not external. So it would be easy for us to say to ourselves, at least I didn't hurt anyone else, like the liar or the thief. But when we start considering the fact that covetousness betrays a subtle disrespect for God, we can begin to see its true sinfulness. Yes. We disrespect God when we covet what He has chosen to supply to our neighbor. But of course, when God gave the Tenth Commandment, God was well aware that sinful human beings rarely end their sin with the thought. Sinful thoughts become sinful deeds. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Eve's lust for the forbidden fruit began in her eyes, but then it moved to an unholy desire to be like God, and then that unholy desire finally came to fruition. The sin which began in Eve's mind came to fruition in full-blown disobedience of the single prohibition God had given our first parents. And that's pretty much the way sin always progresses. Sin may begin in the mind, but it rarely stays there. Jesus explained that very clearly to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 16 through 20, when Jesus said, quote, 
Don't you understand yet? Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer, but the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you, unquote. That's also from the New Living Translation. Exactly. God gave man the capacity to think and to be aware of the world around them. God also gave us, man, the capacity to experience desire. But God also gave us the choice about how we would employ those capacities. He gave us free choice. So we are permitted to direct our desire to a relationship with God or the parts of the created order that are good for us, or we can direct our desires to lesser things, most of which are not going to be good for us. And as we mature, most of us realize that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to simply squelch desire. Just about everyone who has ever decided they need to lose 10 pounds knows that the moment they make a decision to go on that diet, they begin to think about food way more than they did the day earlier. Just about everyone who has to decide to quit smoking or any other bad habit, making the decision to quit doing something triggers the desire to do it. And the desire gets stronger the more we intend to avoid it. It can be a devastating cycle. So rather than just trying to squelch a desire... A better strategy is to redirect the desire, to redirect it from something unhealthy to something healthy. We may have a hard time quenching desire, but we can replace a desire for one thing that's bad for us with the desire for something else that is good for us. But the cynic may just say, why try to quench a desire? Why not just give in to it? After all, life is short and comes with plenty of pain. So why shouldn't we just enjoy the things for which we have desire? Well, if all of our desires were healthy or holy, we could and should give in to them. But one of the big problems with unholy desires is that giving in to them may produce destruction, but it rarely produces satisfaction. The wisest man who ever lived found that out. You're thinking about the book of Ecclesiastes, which most scholars attributed to King David's son Solomon. Solomon was a very rich king. He could literally afford to indulge his every desire. And according to Ecclesiastes, he did. Despite his indulgence, however, ultimately Solomon didn't find his desire quenched. Solomon had almost unlimited political power and wealth. Yet Solomon found out that neither brought him a sense of fulfillment. Solomon indulged in just about every sensual pleasure possible. Solomon tried sex. He had hundreds of wives and concubines. Solomon built huge structures. Solomon developed elaborate gardens. But none of that produced the satisfaction for life that Solomon was seeking. And even when Solomon turned to wisdom and philosophy for satisfaction, he ultimately found out that they did not give him a sense of meaning or fulfillment. So Solomon tried quenching his desires by simply giving in to them, by indulging in each and every passion that came along, but none of it worked. The depth of the desire which God implanted in Solomon, and in everyone else for that matter, simply overwhelms the ability of the world or the flesh to satisfy those desires. So we are back to that God-sized hole in every man. We cannot simply stamp our desire like it's a campfire, and we can definitely not eradicate it by indulging it. One of the major lessons of the Ten Commandments is that even if we went ahead and stole our neighbor's house, spouse, or pets, that would ultimately be a futile act. The covetousness which animated our action would be defeated even if we acted upon it. As Solomon put it in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, quote, Everything is meaningless completely meaningless, unquote. Well, almost. You know, after Solomon worked his way through a description of everything that he had tried to satisfy his various longings, his covetousness, Solomon concluded his meditations in Ecclesiastes in chapter 12. And verses 6 and 7 of chapter 12 say, quote, Yes, remember your Creator now, while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. 
For then the dust will return to the earth, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. And then in the final verses of chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, Solomon said, quote, That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. End quote. And those verses are from the New Living Translation. So really what God was doing when he gave the ancient Israelites and us the Ten Commandments is to help us avoid the pain and anguish that covetousness causes. Coveting our neighbor's possessions is a longing for things that God did not intend for us. And since God is the one who implanted desire in us to begin with, he knows the things that will satisfy us. And of course, the one longing that we are always encouraged to pursue is a longing for a deeper relationship with our Creator. Solomon says, quote, Remember your Creator while you are young, unquote. If we follow Solomon's advice and establish a relationship with God when we are young, we will live far more fulfilled and fulfilling lives as we go through life. So the point of all of this is that the Tenth Commandment, like all of the commandments that precede it, is concerned with dignity and concerned with helping us live better lives. You know, one thread that ties all of the commandments together is that they are concerned with the dignity of God and the dignity of people because people are God's image bearers. The last five of the commandments, they would never have been necessary if the fall had not occurred. Because the primary purpose of the last five commandments is to restrain sin in a fallen creation. But even these commandments are bound up by dignity. The sixth commandment is concerned with the dignity of life. The seventh, the dignity of marriage. The eighth, the dignity of work. The ninth commandment is concerned with the dignity of words, speech, and truth. And the tenth commandment is concerned with the dignity of desire, especially our desire for God. Now, one final point that we should cover before we close for today is that all of these observations point us back to the reality of the creation record that is contained in Genesis. So really, the Tenth Commandment is a perfect bookend for the First Commandment. The First Commandment tells us there is only one true God and that we are not to have any gods before Him. The Tenth Commandment prohibits from coveting our neighbor's possessions, but what it really is doing is reminding us that we should never covet anything other than what God has intended and supplied, and we will automatically be protected from coveting anything that belongs to our neighbor if we do covet God and the things of God. We are not prohibited from coveting. We are prohibited from coveting anything lesser than God himself and the blessings that, in his sovereign determination, He wants to supply to us. God's plan was always that man would have a role in the created order that was different from all of the other creatures that God had created because God made man in his image. And after making man in his image, God then gave man the desire to have a relationship with him and the capacity to act on that desire. You know, sadly, Adam and Eve yielded to the temptations of Satan and began to desire the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They desired that fruit more than they desired the fruit of obedience to God's commands. And that first act of disobedience led to untold mischief, so much mischief that the wisest man who ever lived would be forced to acknowledge that he could find no true satisfaction in anything of this earth. It's impossible to say what the world would have been like if the fall hadn't occurred. It did. But we can see the reliability of the biblical account of creation from the fact that sin introduced in Eden has continued to plague man throughout his history. God gave the Ten Commandments to the people he was sending to found a new nation to give them a firm moral and ethical foundation upon which to build their lives and the nation. Sadly. The ancient Hebrews were no more successful at obeying the Ten Commandments than our first parents were at obeying their one prohibition. And frankly, we can see all about us the fact that the original commandment God gave to Adam and Eve was not only necessary, but right. And we can see that the widespread disobedience to the Ten Commandments, that they are not only necessary, but right. 
Whether one commandment or ten, mankind has a poor history of accepting God's instructions, even when those instructions would produce far better, happier, and more prosperous lives. In a very real sense, the continued widespread presence of sin in our fallen creation shows that the Ten Commandments were a very wise precaution that God took to try to forestall the ultimate decline of His people. And the failure of all of us to honor the Ten Commandments points to our profound need for a Savior to rescue us from our own rebellion. Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden kicked off a sad sequence that continued through the flood, the captivity of the Hebrews in Egypt, and the ultimate fall of both the northern and southern kingdoms that the Exodus would produce in Palestine. But throughout this sad sequence, God continued to unfold His marvelous plan of redemption. And that plan would be consummated in Palestine 1,500 years after God gave the Ten Commandments in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in our next episode of Anchored by Truth, we're going to do a wrap-up on this series of the Ten Commandments. And we're going to try to put together in summation form all of these big thoughts and ideas that surround the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are an important, essential part of the remarkable unity that is demonstrated in the Bible's recounting of the grand saga of creation, fall, and redemption. Well, this sounds like a good time to end for today and go to prayer. Today, let's listen to a prayer for the Son of God, who is the one who was the subject of the plan of redemption and who makes our personal salvation possible. A prayer of adoration of the Son of God. Blessed and holy God, we give you glory, honor, and praise for your goodness and grace. You are majestic in all your ways, and we come before you to honor you as the rightful Sovereign and Lord of our lives. Lord, we praise you for the gift of your Holy Son. By dying and rising, Jesus covered our sinfulness with his perfect righteousness and demonstrated to Satan and the demons that no plan cast against your might and power can ever succeed. Satan's ruin is the full manifestation of Jesus' dominion and that he is worthy to sit eternally at the right hand of the Father. Though the blighted eyes of sinful man cannot now behold the glory of the Father and Son, with authority and power you pull us to yourself and give us vision that no words can fully describe. Christ Jesus is God from God and light from light. He is worthy of worship honor and praise, and he stands astride the mighty rivers of creation, ordaining their course and sending them where he will. There is no body and nothing that can resist his will. He oversees the billows and swells of not just the earthly oceans, but also the greater motions of the heavenly places. He superintends all creation continuously, yet never grows tired or weary. His strength cannot be exhausted and he will never grow old. He will be Lord and Master of all that exists eternally, and His care and provision for us can never be shaken. What love is ours from the Father and Son? We kneel in praise, prayer, and gratitude for Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Is the Bible important in your life? Supporting Anchored by Truth with a contribution is an easy way to put your faith into action. The opportunity to help is available at crystalseabooks.com. How wonderful would it be for Jesus to commend us because we made His Word a priority in our lives and giving. We are grateful for your support and partnership. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage friends to tune in also or to listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com where We're not perfect, but our boss is. And for those of you who need that website one more time, that's crystalseabooks.com. Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, C-S-E-A, 
and books, B-O-O-K-S dot com. Thank you for your support.